What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. Tyrese Halliburton. 499 pick and rolls and isos this year, mm. leading to 629 points. 1.26 points per possession. That's the best self-creator in the league this year. Um, 36 players have run at least 200 pick and rolls. The one we talked about with LeBron where he finished at seventh. He's first on that list, a full seven points per 100 possessions ahead of second place, which was Devin Booker. That's completely ridiculous. A Tyrese Halliburton jumper this year has been worth 1.29 points. A uh, catch and shoot jumper from Tyrese has been worth 1.41 points. Pull ups, 1.26. There doesn't seem to be a coverage that works against him. We uh, we saw, uh, first of all, completely picked apart the Celtics. Then yesterday, he torched the the Bucks in their high drop coverage. He torched the Bucks when they went with a low drop coverage. He torched the Bucks when they went to uh, to a switching scheme. He uh, uh, obviously there was only a handful of possessions against the zone, but they didn't have any trouble scoring against the zone as well. Getting the ball to the middle of the floor to Bruce Brown, there just was nothing they could do with the guy. And I mean, they had a 120 offensive rating against that Boston Celtics team, which has been the second defense, second best defense in the league this year. I so I did a, a rant in my show yesterday where I said that I believe Tyrese Halliburton is on, he's the next in that like group of guys that is, you know, truly has the potential to, to, to be a Pantheon type of player. To me, he's Steve Nash with more athleticism and and a little bit better size. He legitimately, in my opinion, if he stays healthy and makes the moderate improvements on the margins and on the defensive end, I think he has the potential to be an all time. Great. Do you guys agree with me? Let's start with Carson. Yeah, I think that if we are looking at the guys who are, let's say, under 25 in the league today, he's in the top five who you want to build around. You have to have Luka. I think you have to have Wemby. And then I think that I would probably go Ant, Tyrese, and then Chet Holmgren. Shout out Chet. I think he's like a perfect modern center. But Tyrese is unbelievable. And you read off some of the just mind-blowing stats about his production this year. I've got some more that I will now recite. The Pacers are 3.4 points ahead in terms of offensive rating of the number two offense in the NBA right now. That would be the widest margin between the number one offense in the league and the number two offense since 1982. And Tyrese is propelling that unit inarguably without another all-star level talent, which is a very rare thing to lead. First of all, a convincing number one offense, but there's only really two other instances this century of one superstar offensive talent carrying a group without another all-star level guy to the number one offense. It's the 2020 Mavs, Luka doing that in his second season with just a collection of good shooters and solid rim finishers, just unbelievable control of the game, lethal scoring and playmaking threat. And then it's the 2006 Mavs, with Dirk Nowitzki. Outside of that, there's some other teams that only had one all-star, but there's clearly multiple all-star talents, right? It's the 2018 Rockets who had Chris Paul who wasn't an all-star, stuff like that. So he's in rarefied air in terms of the singular impact that he is having, propelling an elite team offense without star level talent. Now he has very good complementary talents, right? He has guys who are very good in transition, which is fundamental to their identity and a great strength of his. And he has awesome spot up shooters. So he's got good play finishers, but he is manufacturing so much of the offense here. Really, really impressive historically. If you look at his individual production and efficiency, nobody has ever averaged 25 points and 12 assists per game in NBA history, period, point blank. Halley is doing that right now on plus 9.8% true shooting versus league average. Nobody has ever averaged 12 assists per game with fewer than two and a half turnovers per game. Halley is doing that right now. The only other player ever to shoot 44% from three on eight and a half attempts per game is 2016 Steph Curry. We are simultaneously (laughs) seeing one of the all-time great jump shooting seasons, one of the all-time great playmaking seasons, and one of the all-time great seasons in terms of amplifying team offense. It is unbelievable. I think he is inarguably a top two shooter in basketball right now. Nobody other than Steph is able to blend this volume both on and off ball with this lethal efficiency. He shoots 44% on pull-up threes. And then I think he's at like 48% off the catch. Just disgusting. And I think that as a playmaker, you see this incredible ability to 
amplify his teammates to really create advantages while also limiting mistakes. And often people will say that a sign of really low turnovers probably means that a guy isn't being creative enough as a playmaker, that he isn't taking enough risks, that he isn't trying to fit enough of those passes into tight gaps or maybe hit a hit ahead pass and transition and he just slightly overshoots it. You should be aggressive creating advantages. And if that leads to a couple more turnovers, that's okay. I think Hallie's in a really healthy blend where, yeah, he's not... Jokic audacious. He's not Magic Johnson audacious. He's not Luka audacious, but he is an aggressive passer who's just never stupid. He's almost <laughs> never inaccurate. I mean, he's just unbelievable. His decision making is basically flawless. And Jason, you're so right about him against every coverage. Pick and roll his ability to manipulate defenders, to move them with his eyes, to open up whatever passing angle he wants. Incredible. He can make every pass out of those actions. When teams try to trap him, he is so composed, so effective in dissecting those actions, not just getting the ball out. I think about that game where he was just torching the Hawks, like the ultimate offensive uh, game this season where they both were up in the 150s, and they start trapping him at half court, and he is making the best possible pass on the floor. Obi Toppin is open in the dunker spot, 40 feet away. He's trapped. He rises up and just fires that pass in there. It's so, so rare. And when you combine that with the takeover scoring that he does have because of this unbelievable pull-up shooting, because, I mean, he is a big ball handler and he is lethal from floor to range. And he's a pretty, pretty good athlete. You see it with a couple of the adjustments around the rim and the rim finishing yesterday. And then he is, to me, the most aware transition playmaker in the NBA today. And that's like the final element when people make the Steve Nash comparisons. And I'm like, yeah, it, it's really there. It is the just masterful pick and roll decision making combined with this unbelievable pull-up shooting that will always make you a more lethal score than the raw numbers indicate. And Halley's putting up some big raw numbers right now. But, I mean, his efficiency is so mind-blowing because he is always going to try to amplify that attention, uh, or I should say weaponize that attention to amplify his teammates first. And then it is that pushing the pace, that awareness of, all right, well, I've got a guy who's outrunning the defense down the floor right now. Boom, hit ahead pass. So many guys don't see those opportunities at the level that Hallie does. He gets you a couple free buckets like that every game. I mean, he is a sensational, generational sort of one-man offense, and uh, everything that he's doing right now is absolutely legit. I don't see any coverage or any player who can slow him down individually because he is such a complete offensive player, and I don't see a team that can slow down this Pacers offense. Now, their defense is another issue entirely, as is Howley's, but offensively, he is a bona fide superstar. Yeah, I don't have a ton to uh, add. Carson did a phenomenal breakdown uh, on our YouTube channel of Tyrese Halliburton, if you guys want to check it out. Uh, I want to contextualize some of those numbers that you throw out uh, that make Halley uh, historically great, Carson. Only six players have ever averaged 12 assists per game in a single season. Kevin Johnson, Magic Johnson, Kevin Porter, John Stockton, Isaiah Thomas, and now Halley. I'd say pretty good company. You mentioned how efficient he's been. He's the third most efficient 25-point-per-game season of all time, behind last year's Kevin Durant, 2018 Steph Curry. And I'd say that's pretty good company. Carson, you mentioned it's the first ever 25-12 season in NBA history. Only 15 players have ever averaged 20 and 10 in a single season. It's it's super remarkable. And it is just as much to do with his playmaking as it is the unstoppable scoring. He's 72% in the paint, non-restricted area. He's 53% on short mid-range attempts, the 43% on long mid-range attempts. And the only aspect I think you didn't hit on is him in big moments this season. We have now seen him in two massive games on the biggest stage of this very young season on the in-season tournament against Boston. Not only carve them up and dissect them the entire game, playmaking and scoring, on the biggest stage, on the biggest part of the game, he said, I'm going to put up a pull-up three because I'm that great of a shooter and I'm going to wet it because I'm that guy. And he does. And he knocks off the Boston Celtics. And then in another big-time clutch moment, knocks down another crucial pull-up jumper to knock off the Bucks, who we are considering to be the two best teams in the Eastern Conference. I just think that's another aspect, too. Mm -hmm. He didn't blink. In a big-time moment, you know, we have these issues with Jason Tatum in the clutch, right, with what he does offensively. Allie doesn't have these issues, right? He just said, I'm going to do it because I'm that guy. I'm going to take that shot. I'm going to make it. Uh, it's the totality of it, and I do. I think he's got the potential – I think we're already seeing it. I mean, he's one of the best offensive players on the planet right now, and to overlook that is just wrong to him. But that's the final component to me is the clutch gene that we've seen from Halley. Some guys do fear the moment. Some guys do shy away. Halley's not one of those guys, and like you mentioned, whatever you throw at him, he's got a counter. If you want to shut this down, he's going to get a bucket this way. It's 
it's very different in the way he does it to Nikola Jokic, but you know, that unstoppable, that un that inevitable feeling that you get from him, I kind of also get that from Hallie a little bit, man. Yeah, he straight up alpha dogs Jason Tatum and Damian yep. Lillard and Giannis in the same week in high leverage big, situations. Big dogged him. Big like, dogged just, him. Just straight up alpha dogged him and talked shit while doing it. Like it just, just it was completely ridiculous. I think th- he reminds me of Jokic in the sense that it's like there is no tenable defensive strategy. If you play mm-hmm. him to be a scorer, he's going to beat you a well over a point and a point you know, 1.2 points per possession. If you play him to be a passer, he's going to beat you to the tune of 1.2 points per possession. Like it's a yeah, unique combination to your list, Carson, real quick before we move on. Yeah. You had mentioned four guys. I, we had this conversation last week or two weeks ago. I think it was last week, two weeks ago. Who, who knows? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to switch Halliburton and Ant. I, I understand I, all the things I said about Ant are true. This is not a bad Ant take. This is a pro Halliburton take. Mm-hmm. I think he I think he has all-time great offensive player written all over him. And I think that to me, that makes him a better big picture prospect than Ant. Just just by going over the top of him, not by Ant dropping in any way, shape, or form. Luke is interesting because I would never say that that Halliburton's better than Luca, not just because their fans are crazy and they would murder me alive. <laughs> but at the, uh but at the, but at the same time, like I do think there's something to be said in the big picture about the potential that Halliburton has to be better than Luca. And it comes down to two things. In my opinion, he's so much faster and has good length, which I think will give him the ability to be a better defender in the big picture than Luca can ever be just because of his lack of foot speed. And then two, I think tires Halliburton plays a way more likable brand of basketball. Oh yeah. And I think, in, and I think in general, uh, like because he plays with pace, like Tyrese is heliocentric, but He's heliocentric with a quick trigger to get rid of the ball, not mm-hmm. just in transition situations, but in half court situations. And I think the the methodical Luka Doncic thing, there are certain types of players who thrive in that specific types of play finishers, but there are other types of players who struggle in that environment. And we've seen that over the years. And so while I think Luka is a better player than Tyrese Halliburton right now, and obviously his physical imposition offensively as like a matchup attacker is a is an important element to factor in there, but I think Tyrese has the potential to be a better player than Luka in the long run. I think he legitimately has that potential. And then and then the Wemby piece, it's like he's an alien, so I don't even know how you know it. Like, how do you even do a basketball breakdown of that? Like, it's right. ridiculous, right? <laughs> 